Welcome to the Pursuing Points Podcast, where it's all about the pursuit of credit card points and miles today so that you can travel the world free of charge tomorrow. And now, your host, Peter Foti. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pursuing Points Podcast. I am your host, as always, Peter Foti. Uh, and I'm joined today by a very special guest. Uh, his name is Mr. Jeb Brooks, and he is a trip report YouTuber. I will let him sort of explain what that means. Uh, Jeb and I have been talking about doing a podcast together for some time. Uh, scheduling made it somewhat difficult, but we're finally here, which I'm super excited about. I think he's got a lot of good stuff to tell us today. Uh, so welcome to the show, Jeb. How are you? I'm great, Peter. Thank you so much for having me, and hello to everyone out there listening. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so for those of you who don't know, uh, like I said, Jeb is a YouTuber. I will have a link to his channel in our show notes. Uh, I think I may have started watching your channel. Honestly, you may have had less than like 10,000 subscribers at the time. And I think the other day I saw you're over 40. Is that right? That's crazy. It's unbelievable. <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> uh, yeah, his, your, your videos are awesome. Um, basically, why don't you just kind of tell us a little bit about the channel, what it is that a trip report YouTuber kind of does. Uh, let's just start there. Great. No, thank you again. And I think the best way to tell you is to talk about how I got into this. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, like many of your listeners, I'm travel obsessed. I, I travel a good bit for work and, uh, also of course, uh, for pleasure. And I started, uh, watching these videos on YouTube of people who were traveling specifically on airplanes. And I just got sucked into these things and couldn't stop watching. And, and one day it occurred to me, well, I got all this time on, on airplanes, so why don't I start recording my trips and putting them out there? And uh, it has uh, sort of uh, grown from there. So a trip reporter is literally that. It's somebody who makes a report about a trip they take. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are all, all kinds of folks doing it in all kinds of different ways. I just happen to be really into airplanes, so I tend to – focus on the passenger experience, uh, typically in business and first class cabins and, uh, have had some pretty amazing experiences as a result of it. It's interesting that you brought up the passenger experience stuff because that's a great segue. We were going to talk about this perhaps a little bit later, but now that you mentioned it, we'll just sort of dive right into it. So you have sort of a rating criteria that you use in each one of your trip reports to talk about like the overall, uh, product. Uh, so I have that as seat, in-flight entertainment, food, and in-flight cabin crew. Does that sound right? That's exactly right. Those are the things that sort of uh, resonate with me when I'm traveling. And so what I want to start with is, one, how has that list evolved? And then, two, I want us to talk a little bit about sort of the evolution of that passenger experience, right? Obviously, flying in, I don't know, say the 70s is obviously a lot different than it was today. In some ways, it's better. In some ways, it's probably worse. Uh, but I want to know, from your perspective, both since you started YouTubing and I guess even since you started flying, how have how has that sort of evolved along each one of those ranking criteria that you have? Well, it started out um, really because it, it, it was a way for me to organize what I was doing, you know, to make sure that I, I hit the things. Look, as a passenger, you know, obviously, you know, element number one is can I get from point A to point B? That's, mm -hmm. that's really all um, – an airline is responsible for in their contract of carriage, and that's even debatable depending on <laughs> particular circumstances. <laughs> yep. But then as I've um, – as the airline experiences I've had have evolved, to use your word, and I've, I've opened my eyes to other, um, other airlines and other destinations and so on and so forth, I've kind of looked for what's the consistent sort of um, – what are the consistent sort of elements that each airline offers – Again, specifically in more premium cabins. Mm -hmm. uh, although, you know, Y fares, coach cabins certainly have these have these components too. But there's there's a little bit more to share on video, at least um, in in those business and first class cabins, and yeah. and that's really where it's come from. Look, you know, fundamentally, how does the seat feel? Can I sleep sleep in the seat? Is it comfortable? Is there a bar sticking through my back? What, you know, what is the, what is the seat like? Number one, number two, I think is, you know, I, I really have kind of gravitated toward long haul flights. Um, you know, as a result of, um, well, as I said earlier, work and, and other, other, other reasons, but, um, that, that means food becomes, uh, fairly important and airlines have, uh, have really come a long way. I, I fly a lot with Delta, 
uh, airlines. And I've noticed specifically their catering has really, um, at least in my opinion, uh, gone up a notch or three in the last couple of years. Um, and then the third, the third component that uh, has come out of there is the in-flight entertainment. And again, kind of back to the point, uh, or the original point, all I expect is A to B. I have sort of grown to not expect much, if anything, from in-flight entertainment. Uh, I tend to travel with my own because I've had more than my fair share of experiences where it doesn't work or you know, there's nothing to watch or that kind of thing. So if there's something special there, that's definitely worth highlighting. And then the fourth component, and this is really the difference maker, Peter. I think this is where airlines either hit or miss, and it's the pa- it's it's the 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 service level, right? It's yep. the it's the cabin crew, and there's been a lot of talk in the YouTube trip reporter quote unquote community lately that really the the crew experience that we have is is really more a reflection of us as passengers. And as I've observed crews and other passengers, I think that's true. What do I mean? Nine times out of 10, um, a negative crew experience, at least the ones that I see, are a result of passengers giving off negative vibes. In other words, I don't think anybody goes into um, a cabin crew job with the goal of giving bad experiences. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So if there's, if there's a a bad apple somewhere in the cabin, um, that's probably what's driving a bad crew. In other words, let me put this a different way. If a crew, if you, if you experience something negative with a crew, there's a pretty good chance. There's a, there's a, uh, something bad happening in the cabin somewhere else. Right. That makes sense. My mother's actually a flight attendant. She has been, uh, for pretty much my whole life. And so I've heard a lot of stories uh, about sort of the passengers that maybe you're describing where either they're unruly or just any number of things that they might do. And then, of course, that sort of sets the tone for the crew and sort of the rest of the trip. I think that's sort of what you're describing. Yeah, I, I just this is an interesting um, little aside. I just got back um, from Shanghai and I flew China Eastern domestically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, this, I had been a long time since I was on a Chinese airline. And there was a guy who was a member of the cabin crew whose responsibility was basically security. So he came on and made an, a, an announcement um, in English that it, you know, he was responsible for controlling any unruly passengers, anybody that was jostling or, or causing any trouble. So they've, they've taken it to another level. And uh, I don't know. I think, I think it was a federal requirement in China, but certainly oh, Chinese. Wow. That was an interesting element for me. Interesting. Yeah, I don't think I've ever, uh, I've never had that experience before, but, uh, you know, sir, and I think another thing too is like expectations that people have. And, you know, if you have these very high expectations and then they're not met, maybe that's going to cause you to act a certain way. Uh, but at the end of the day, right, the in-flight crew, they're just trying to do their job. So, uh, especially if we're up lucky enough to like sit in first class, we just kind of have to enjoy that experience. Cause obviously we weren't always sitting up there, right? So, that's exactly that's right. Cool. That's pretty cool. Um, so you mentioned that you fly in Delta a lot, is that right? Yes, sir. And is that because of proximity to a hub, or what What made you choose Delta? All right, so I live in Greensboro, North Carolina, primarily. And um, uh, so we really, we're kind of a mid-sized city with, with not a lot of carriers. And, and many years ago, I was starting in my career, and um, I'm in the consulting business, so that meant a lot of tra- travel. And I had some flexibility in terms of which airline I chose. This relates directly to what we were just talking about, really. I flew, um, I flew with Delta, and then I flew with US Air at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was sort of comparing them and trying to decide which, which airline was I going to go with. And I just had, you know, if I'm, if I'm in Greensboro, I'm going to fly through Charlotte with US Air, now American, of course, or Atlanta with Delta, as most of the world knows. Uh, every, every place in the world is connected through Atlanta somehow. And, uh, um, so ultimately I had a better experience with Delta. Uh, so as a result, I've, I've committed to them and, uh, uh, you know, have maintained my loyalty, uh, with them until I started this YouTube thing. And that's opened my, opened my eyes to a lot of other opp- opportunities, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a, a factor of number one, uh, proximity to Atlanta and number two, um, just the, uh, that initial, uh, experience with the, with, uh, cabin crews. Yeah. 
That's interesting. You know, people sometimes ask me like uh, when they're trying to compare different elite statuses, like who should they choose as like a primary airline? But I think you just sort of described it, right? Proximity is very important, right? They, your airline of choice has to support the routes that you're going to fly most often. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter, right? Like if you chose United, that's probably going to not work out as well as it could if you lived in like Chicago because you don't have a hub close to you. So I think that's really important. Um, and you, honestly, these segues are fantastic. Uh, you talked about your loyalty. So what status did you have? And then how, I was going to ask you, like, sort of how has that evolved since you've started YouTubing? Okay, so I, um, I am uh, Diamond with Delta. I've been Diamond for the last um, five years with them. Okay. And, um, it, you know, that's that has been really work related travel. And mm-hmm. then this YouTube thing has, I keep using the phrase, opened my eyes. And I, I think that's, that's exactly right to trying new airlines. I, you know, so for example, I have, um, I had the opportunity earlier, well, I guess last year now to fly with Singapore on their inaugural route from Newark uh, to Singapore, which is at least as of right now, the longest flight in the world. Um, mm-hmm. I never would have done that without um, without um, flying or without the YouTube channel, um, yeah. and, and so that's been a really fun part of this uh, of this project. I've, I've flown with Emirates and Netihad and um, uh, you know other airlines that aren't even uh, Air Azores, uh, which was an incredible experience from uh, um, Boston to Punta Delgada in the in the in the Azores or Azores, and um, you know just because it was. You know, it re- reportedly such a bad experience, yeah. uh, you know, again, I would not have done that without the, without the channel. And now when you're flying on these alternative airlines, so to speak, are you crediting the miles that you're earning to like, let's say you're flying on a sky team partner. Are you crediting the miles to your Delta account or do you have sort of mileage balances all over the place? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I want to use, um, uh, so in terms of mileage, I'm crediting pretty much everything to um, U.S. carriers. So I've got status um, um, platinum on American. I think I'm only silver with United uh, and then diamond with Delta. So I'm bringing it all to the U.S. That just gives me the most flexibility. Um, yeah. You know, so I lose a little bit of advantage, but the, I don't need you know a big balance of Qantas miles. I'd rather have those. I'd rather have those in. in uh, you know, in sort of quote unquote local currency. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and now back to the uh, Delta elite status. So you said you've had it for five years. One of the things that I'm always curious to know, so the highest status that I ever attained was platinum with Delta. And that's when I was flying a fair amount for work. These days I don't fly as much for work. It tends to be all personal. So I get up to maybe gold at best. Uh, but sort of what's been interesting with Delta is, and I'll put some air quotes around it, the sort of devaluation over time of their status. And I think people mainly use that term to mean that, let's say if you're a diamond medallion, like five or six years ago, you're probably going to get upgraded to first class, maybe 90 plus percent of the time. Whereas now, especially if you, if Atlanta is what you fly through, maybe that's only 50 or 60% of the time. So how has the status that you have with Delta changed in those five years? And like, Obviously, there is going to be a requirement that you continue to fly for business, so maybe it doesn't matter. But if if that didn't matter and you sort of had your druthers, would you still choose Delta uh, today as you did five years ago? Wow, that's that's uh, there's a lot packed in there. Um, a lot of strong feelings too. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that diamond status is definitely, at least in my opinion, and this is certainly debatable uh, and sure. a, a debate I would really love to have with anybody. Um, mm-hmm. it is, I think less valuable than it was, um, you know, the first year I got it. I think right. part of that is, uh, is the fact that, um, well, how about this? There is talk in the, um, the frequent flyer community that the value that came from diamond status many years ago, several years ago will return this year as a result of the, and then especially next year, as a result of the fact that they, they, brought that credit card um, uh, uh, requirement up to a quarter million dollars you had to spend in order to get the, the on the Amex uh, reserve uh, Delta reserve card. Right. Um, so in theory, at least that will mean there'll be fewer diamonds, mm-hmm. you know, um, which may increase the benefit. 
that that said, I think what um, what Delta are doing is really focusing on um, encouraging passengers to pay for experiences. Yeah, uh, and I think Delta, you know, from the business side of look as a passenger, I don't really like it, but as a as a business guy, I really respect it. Like they they have they know how to drive consumer behavior. They know how to how to get dollars from our wallets. I mean, look. It's so great that sky miles never expire, right? Yeah. Well, because they never expire, they've got to devalue them, mm-hmm. right? So, so good luck finding a, a, a trip to, to, you know, a Delta One flight to Australia for anything, you know, reasonable, uh, right. simply because the currency has to de- devalue since it never expires. Um, not quite related to the, to, the, um, to the status, you know, valuation, but... Um, no, but, but that, that makes I, sense. I, mm-hmm. Um, so would I still fly with Delta today? Um, yeah, I would. And the reason is because um, they're the most reliable. So I, I mentioned I spend, I live in Greensboro, North Carolina. I, I also um, spend um, about half my time in Washington, D.C. So I have two options there. I, I can, in terms of flying between Greensboro and Washington, I can leave Greensboro on American Airlines, um, regional carrier, CRJ 200, um, and uh, fly directly from Greensboro. Or I can drive to Raleigh uh, and grab a um, CRJ 900 uh, with Delta connection uh, right into Reagan as well. Now that adds an extra hour because I've got to drive. But ultimately, I pick Delta, not out of loyalty to, to, to the program and to the, to the diamond status, but rather because they just run a more reliable airline. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if there's, there's about a... 60% chance, roughly, that my flight between Washington and Greensboro uh, with American is going to be delayed significantly. And by that, I mean more than an hour. Whereas with Delta, the things like clockwork, they just, they, I, I find they run a more efficient airline. Interesting. I think that makes sense. I think that you are the target market for Delta from like a business traveler perspective, right? And, and I think their goal, like on time percentage is probably the most important thing to them because if business travelers are consistently dealing with delays, they're probably not going to travel for business on Delta anymore. So I think that that makes and sense. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and, and I think leisure travelers too. I mean, I can remember I, I had a, a trip with, um, with American down to Bolivia. It was purely pleasure. And, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the rolling delays just, it, it just adds a level of anxiety to, to the experience that, um, I think doesn't make for a pleasant holiday. Sure. Um, it's interesting that you left off the third option for going from Greensboro to uh, Washington. I actually just watched this video on your channel uh, yesterday. <laughs> the uh, the train. Yes. Yes. Um, so I've talked about Amtrak not a fair amount, but I've talked about it a little bit on the podcast. My use case for Amtrak is New York City to Philadelphia, which. And for me, in that route, I love it. Reason being is, one, you show up to the Amtrak station, there is no security line, you just get on the train. And it turns out that flying actually takes more, actually takes longer from NYC to Philly uh, than flying does, especially in New York, because you have to get to the airport, which takes sometimes an hour in and of itself. Um, but your experience was a little bit different than mine. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? I learned a lot about um, that. So that was, you know, a video going uh, viral, again, air quotes, uh, Uh in in the trip reporting space is a relative thing. Uh, But the closest I've ever come was that Amtrak video. And there are um, true loyalists to Amtrak, people who Mm -hmm. absolutely take passion for something to another level. And Mm -hmm. I was looking at the Amtrak experience through the lens of somebody who is a frequent flyer. And that is not the way to look at Amtrak according to Amtrak fans. And I received a great deal of hate <laughs> on that video, which, uh, which is part of the deal. And, and I, was, I was grateful for the feedback. Um, Amtrak, I found to be, um, for, for the route between Greensboro and Washington, it was just, it was significantly longer than, than, and certainly flying and even driving. Um, I think that the, that the reason that you take Amtrak on a route like that is, is not, not necessarily because it's the, it's the best 
way to go. It's, it's about, you know, experiencing the scenery or riding the train or, um, it's, it's the, the only option you have for whatever reason. Um, look, I, I get the nostalgia of it. I think there's some really interesting, uh, uh, route. It sounds like out West where you can really experience the country, um, mm-hmm. you know, the empire builder, or I think it's the starlight express. There's some really cool routes that are about the journey. They're not about, you know, um, an, an efficient way to get from point A to point B. Um, and that said, I think you're right about, you know, taking the train in the Northeast makes a ton of sense, um, yeah. because you don't have the security time and so on and so forth. Interesting. But you are going to give it one more shot. Did I, did I read that? You're going to try maybe a sleeper train, something like that? Yes, I am. I'm, I am getting up my nerve. I'm afraid I might be recognized by one of the people who I offended. Uh, so I need to, I need to like get a nose job or something and then I'll go. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, like I said, everybody should subscribe to your YouTube channel. We'll be keeping an eye out for that. Um, okay. So we've talked a lot about the travel. Uh, This is like sort of a credit card focused podcast. So I do want to try to talk about that a little bit. Um, Let's start with, uh, so you mentioned the Delta diamond waiver. So for those of you who don't know Delta, you have to meet uh, either their MQS uh, or their MQM requirement, which is segments or miles. You have to fly a certain number. And then you also have to either meet their MQD requirement, which is medallion qualifying dollars. What is it for diamonds? Uh, 12,000 or 15,000? 15,000. 15,000. So you either have to spend 15,000 on Delta or in years past, what you could do is spend 25,000 on any one of their co-branded credit cards to sort of get rid of that. And the reason that that was so valuable is that to meet the 15,000 spend, you basically have to be consistently flying in first class. If you buy a lot of economy tickets, it's going to be hard to do. Um, And so... But what Delta did as a result of the sort of diamond overcrowding, if you will, is raise that to $250,000, which basically means that for the most part, unless you're like a big business spender, I suppose, I don't really expect too many people to hit that. Um, And so from a diamond's perspective that actually is earning the status by flying alone, it sounds like that's beneficial for you. So I guess the first question is, do you have any of the Delta credit cards or have you ever had them? Yeah, I I I, um, I do now have a Delta Reserve credit card. In the past, I've had um, I had a couple of others back when you were sort of able to layer things and 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 all that. But I've decided to concentrate most of my spending. Um, so I'll use that Reserve card for large purchases just to um, get the um, the um, additional you know, sort of miles that you get out of that. But my yep. day-to-day spending is with is on a Chase Sapphire Reserve card. Interesting. Okay, so you have a Chase Sapphire Reserve, you have a Delta Reserve. Those would be what we would consider like two premium products. Um, are those the only cards that are in your wallet? Um, I've got a, um, I do have a Platinum Amex as well, which I use um, when I'm booking airfare for um, these non-Delta flights. Uh, mm-hmm. because of the points that, that, that come off of that. Uh, and um, all, yeah, so uh, that one and the reserve card, for that matter, get me access to the Sky Club, uh, Delta Sky Club, which I find immensely valuable. Interesting. So, okay, so you use the Platinum when you're booking flights that are not on Delta. So when do you use that card for different purchases? Like, how are you accruing points on it? Uh, on the, uh, the Amex, it's, uh, primarily, so there, there it's, um, airfare. I'm getting points on the airfare that I book with it. And then are you transferring those points to different partner airlines? Correct. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, like for example, um, I'm looking at doing United Airlines Island Hopper, which is a flight from, um, Honolulu to Guam by way of five, um, Pacific Islands. It's a, it's kind of a, uh, an av geeks dream flight. Uh, mm-hmm. and it's usually pretty expensive. Um, but, uh, you know, with, with those, um, uh, Amex points, I can transfer them over and, and, uh, m- m- you know, book it fairly reasonably. Interesting. Yeah. I've never heard of such a flight. Um, but that sounds super cool. Uh, when you're looking for these flights and you're sort of trying to maximize your miles and whatnot, are there any like tools or tips, of the or I guess tips or tools of the trade 
that you've sort of acquired over the years to help you do this better, especially now that you have the YouTube channel and you do this a lot? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I think the best tool out there is expertflyer.com. So recently I just, um, I just came back um, day before yesterday from the UK and I flew BA1, which is uh, British Airways A318 service from London City Airport uh, into JFK. So it's a really small airplane. Uh, There are only 32 seats in the plane. And I booked that with uh, Chase Points. I was able to find that award availability, which was really quite reasonable, um, uh, using Expert Flyer. Uh, you know, and, and I don't know enough about I'm sure there's a way on the British Airways website to figure that out and find it there. But um, using Expert Flyer is consistent across most airlines and uh, is a really great tool. I also like Google Flights. Interesting. Yeah, Google Flights is the one that I tend to use the most. But Expert Flyer... Uh, it's also a pretty neat tool. I'll be sure to link to that in the show notes so other people can uh, take a look at it. Do you have to pay for either of those? Uh, Google Flights, no. Uh, Expert Flyer, there is a uh, – maybe – I don't know what it is. I want to say like $19 a year, but I, I could be way off on that. Um, I, I'm sure we can put it in the show notes. And it's it's well yeah. worth it um, you know, to be able to really um, uh, you know, look for availability, not only in terms of awards, but also uh, checking seat maps for flights. It is – I think uh, the best way to um, sort of play the, you know, if I'm, if I'm flying in in, um, in economy on a, a long haul flight, particularly, to, how, how do I find that row that's empty? How can I defend my seat? Um, you know, because you can really see the seat maps uh, very clearly. It takes a little time to learn. Uh, it's it's kind of an antiquated inter- interface, but it's it's a really slick tool. Awesome. Um, yeah, trying, I, I, that's the first, what, what was the term you used? Defend your seat, defend your row. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, if you, if you, the, uh, what do they call it? The, um, uh, the, the lie flat, uh, bed at a, at an economy fair. So if you can, if you can, uh, uh, find one of those three or four, uh, row sections with, without anybody in it and, uh, you know, sort of keep an eye on it, uh, uh, you know, uh, defend your row, um, you know, uh, in other words, you can see the um, you can sure. see what what's going on, who's who's moving around, where, and all this inside Expert Flyer. Whereas you know you're relying on a friendly gate agent or uh, or something like that if you can't see a seat map on a particular airline. Yeah, no, guess what? I do it all the time. If you know when I'm flying JetBlue or Delta, I'll have their app open right up until they turn off. Turn off uh, when they start boarding, they disallow access from the app to change your seat. Uh, but right up until that point, I'll be checking it to make sure that. I don't have anybody next to me if I can help it. Um, so that's cool. I'm glad. I, I like coining that term, though, defend your row. Um, <laughs> that's pretty neat. Okay, so so you have the Delta Reserve. You've got the Chase Sapphire Reserve. You have the MX Platinum. Um, have you considered uh, adding any other cards to your portfolio, like any other the uh, Chase cards, like, for example, the Freedom Unlimited, so that you could earn points on that and then transfer them to the Reserve? I, I have thought about it, um, but I, I sort of have this system down, and, and you know, you get you get comfortable with the way things work, and, and then mm-hmm. um, uh, and, and you, you sort of accept it. But uh, you're right; I, I think there are some really compelling cards out there that would probably complement what I'm doing if, if I if I uh, pull the trigger on them. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, for example, and I talk about this a fair amount. Uh, like the Freedom Unlimited doesn't earn the same ultimate rewards points that your reserve does, but you can actually transfer those points to your reserve so that they come out the same. And of course, with the reserve, you can transfer them to partners, you can redeem them for uh, sort of a, a 50% travel bonus, et cetera. Uh, so that might be something to uh, to keep in mind for the future. Um, and obviously you're all set with lounge access. Uh, you can pretty much access anything with those three cars, which is pretty cool. Um, awesome. So, I was going to start with this at the beginning, but I guess we'll we'll sort of wind down the show with this. So on your website, uh, which is greenergrass.com, uh, again, I'll link to that, you say that you want to travel to each of the 193 UN member states. And that seems like a very audacious goal. Uh, so I'm interested, did that come up as a result of the YouTube channel, uh, or did you have that before? Um, and can you give us an update on how that's going? Yeah, so I had um, a, a, an unbelievable experience back in 2012. Really, um, I, I don't hesitate to use the term life changing. I was able to take a um, a trip literally around the world. So it was it was a uh, 
one of those great uh, round the world tickets. It was a Sky Team ticket, and uh, I hit um, you know about twelve uh, countries in uh, you know about thirty five days or so, and and it really opened my eyes to the idea of. Um, uh, of international travel, which up until that point had not been something that I'd really considered. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I, I loved the feeling that I got of moving from one uh, culture to another. So going from, say, um, Monaco to Madagascar in a matter of just a few hours, it's, it, it is, is mind blowing and, and eye opening. I keep using the term, but it really is. It's the right one. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, had, I really started in, in 2012, um, you know, with with um, intentionality around this, and um, I'm now I've now visited 56 of the 193. So I've got a long way to go. There are loads of people who have uh, who have uh, done this and serve as inspiration to me. Uh, it's not an easy uh, task to take on, uh, and it requires you know time and energy and 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 frankly dollars and. Uh, um, uh, so the YouTube thing has kind of come out of that because, you know, uh, uh, a will, an ability to, um, share some of it. And, and, uh, um, it, it seems to have sort of resonated with people. You know, as you pointed out, the, the, the channel has, has grown far beyond what I expected. And, uh, it's, that's been really amazing. And, uh, you know, ho- hopefully there'll be ways to share a little bit of what I experienced on the ground, uh, at some point with this this endeavor, I mean, up until this point, it's really just been what's going on in the air. Uh, but uh, you know, maybe maybe someday I'll be able to tie some of the some of the experiences I have on the ground in there as well. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Uh, well, listen, I'm going to keep following along. I, I hope that you can hit that goal. I think I follow some. Uh, is it Lee uh, Abamonte? I think he's done all 193. Yeah. Does that sound right? Do you follow him? He has. Yeah, he's he's a really cool guy. Yeah. So, uh, well, I thought we'd hear to me in some rarefied air if you can get there, and I'm sure that you will. Uh, basically, that's all I have for today. Uh, but I want to give you the opportunity to sort of, uh, one, tell people uh, where they can find you on the Internet, and obviously we'll link to all of your stuff below. Um, and I guess any party thoughts you have for us? No, I just yeah. Thank you so much, Peter, for having me. I mean, this is this is a real uh, honor to, 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 to talk with you, and I appreciate the insight you shared uh, on, uh, how to improve my credit card portfolio. I made a couple of notes and I think, uh, I think you've given me some, some good ideas that it, maybe it's time to change a couple of things, but if folks want to follow along, I, I hope they'll check me out on YouTube. Uh, easiest way to do that is just to head over to YouTube and, and type in Jeb, J E B Brooks. And, uh, I should come up, but we'll, we'll have those links in the show notes. Uh, and, uh, if you like airplanes, uh, you might want to check me out on Instagram as well. Jeb Brooks flies. Uh, is that one. But uh, Peter, again, thank you so much for, for including me and, and thank you to everybody out there listening. This is, um, I could talk about travel all day long as I'm sure most, most of the folks who are out there listening could as well. So let's, uh, let's keep doing that. Awesome. Yeah. And guess what? When you hit the 193, I think we're going to have to have you back on the, uh, back on the podcast. That sound good? No, well, that sounds good. This is too much fun. So I got to, I got to accelerate it. I got to make it happen faster. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, if you get to New York as well, we could do a little meetup. So let me know. That'd be fun. Um, but all right. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll have all those links in the show notes. And I hope people enjoy the episode. Thank you, Peter. I will right, we'll talk to you later.